Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the Diveiki Cardiovascular Life Studios. I am Ulysses Baltazar. I am a vascular surgeon with Houston Methodist Cardiovascular Surgery Associate Group. And I want to welcome you to this new segment of this, uh, of this program that uh, Methodist has put uh, together, the Diveiki Cardiovascular Life uh, Lectures. Today is the first episode of the Vein and Lymphatic uh, Forum. In this segment that will be streamed on every Wednesday of uh, uh, every fourth Wednesday of every month, we'll try to bring you the latest in diagnostic treatment uh, pathophysiology of vein disease. We will interview uh, leaders in the field around the country, uh, present cases and most importantly, have an interaction with uh, our viewers in order to enhance our practices. We learn from each other. So uh, we'll encourage you to uh, send your questions, your comments. The information how to reach us during this, um, this transmission is going to be on the screen in a few seconds. And uh, feel free to, to contact us. So without further ado, uh, Today's show will be divided in uh, two segments. The first segment, I'm going to discuss uh, some of this new trend to join um, uh, veins and lymphatics in one single pathology, no pathology, in one single field that has been happening for the past 15, 20 years. And in the second segment, we are going to uh, interview one of our uh, partners here in Houston, Dr. Uh, Joseph Naum who has done a lot of vein work and uh, he is going to uh, help us out with some questions and some comments. So without further ado, let's start with this presentation about uh, the venolymphatic trend that is happening in, in all over the world for that matter. So when you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail and you want to try to your, uh, use your skills in one way. I like this phrase because it exemplifies a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of us, what we do in our fields. So when I trained, when I did my uh, fellowship in vascular surgery here at Methodist Hospital, I was one of the first uh, classes that uh, Dr. Lomsde graduated in 2001, and two, somewhere around that, that year. Uh, the arterial surgery was the golden boy. And vein surgery was the, the, you know, the stepchild but lymphatic uh, surgery or lymphatic pathology was not even in the family. So it's been uh, relegated throughout the years and now it's coming back and the, uh, there is a huge push in order to uh, bring the lymphatic vessels within active part of the uh, circulation arterial and venous. So the veins were relegated uh, somehow in the back of the of the of the uh, of the screen until 1999, when the FDA approved radiofrequency ablation in the United States. This technique has been used in Europe uh, prior, but in 1999 was approved in, in our country. And this is a minimally invasive procedure that opened tremendous opportunities to treat vein disease uh, uh, with local to medicine anesthesia, no need for general anesthesia, minimally invasive as well, and it's an office vein procedure. So what happened is that in the year 2000, there was a boom of vein treatments. Uh, the insurance companies that, uh, as you know, they are based their uh, reimbursement according to the CMS, uh, 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 the way the CMS pays and reimburse the procedures, uh, start, you know, I'm sorry, all these procedures were well paid. So the boom began and everybody started trying to do uh, vein uh, procedures in the office, thinking that was easy or was easy to manage with, you know, no problems at all. But uh, it was uh, basically an abuse of, of, of the system. But what did we start encountering? We started encountering patients with edema, uh, but no evidence of venous insufficiency. And that presented a conundrum in the diagnostic of the patient. What are we going to uh, offer this patient? If the veins are okay, what is the cause in the edema? And therefore, uh, we got to learn about lymphatic 
physiology and lymphedema. So the trend that I say earlier that for the past 15, 20 years to bring the lymphatics within the family of the uh, vascular uh, surgery, the vascular medicine uh, is being um, supported by many, many of our organizations like the American College of Phlebology, one of the most respected organizations in our country in regards of uh, uh, vein disease in 2018 changed the name to the American Vein and Lymphatic Society, try to include the lymphatics into this, uh, in, into their uh, purview. So American Venus Forum then added as well the uh, promoting venous and lymphatic health. And other organizations that have been developing throughout these few years, Foundation for Venous and Lymphatic Disease, and also the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine. So there is this trend to uh, unite the, the vein and the lymphatic uh, pathophysiology and, and treatment in a very active role. Even uh, one uh, of our most respected journals, the Journal of Vascular Surgery, founded by Dr. DeBakey, now has three different um, brothers or sisters, has two brothers or sisters, whatever you want to call it, you know. Now, one of them is the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders, and the other one is, of course, the Journal of Vascular Surgery Cases and Innovative Techniques. So this trend to um, uh, bring lymphatics closer to the veins is inevitable. So we need to learn and find out why this is happening. And I, during the, this talk, I'm going to talk about microcirculation and what happens in the capillaries that uh, change the perception of the lymphatics. That's the importance of this, this, uh, this talk. I know it's not surgically uh, inclined. Uh, for us that we love surgery, sometimes these topics are a little bit um, unattractive, let's say. But I think it's important that we understand what are the um, bases of, um, of the physiology that happens at the capillary level that make the lymphatics so important that previously they were not considered that important. Um, and we are going to touch in during this presentation in a very simple way, in a very uh, rapid way. We are not going to dive too deep into um, the equations and all that different uh, environment because, uh, frankly, I'm not an expert. I'm just uh, want to learn about this because I think it's important and I found so uh, so much um, uh, new material that has helped me understand the pathophysiology and what is happening at the capillary level. Well, in the in the microcirculation in the capillary levels, the uh, you know it's being defined in many ways. It's a dynamic, organized chaos because there are empty and filled capillaries at the same time in different areas and. There is, a, there is a movement that is called flux motion that has puzzled some of the researchers. Um, and we are not going to talk about too much about this, but it's important to know this flux motion is like this, uh, I will call it maybe a perist peristaltic movement that the capillaries uh, do in order to propulse the blood from one end to another without having any muscle layers within. within. And obviously is um, controlled by metabolic, physical, uh, humoral and nervous uh, uh, stimuli. So the three the three segments of the uh, flow of the blood flow in the microcirculation are the capillary flow regulation that is getting the blood there, the hydrostatic oncotic equilibrium that we know as a Starling principle, and filtration that is how the lymph is formed. And this is explained by the revised Starling principle. That's something that we need to learn. We are going to concentrate in this segment uh, more than anything else. And we are going to review the story real quick. I think these uh, uh, researchers, physicians, investigators that dedicate their life to uh, uh, develop this knowledge and, 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 and pass this knowledge to us, they deserve to be mentioned. Uh, even briefly, but I think uh, we need to uh, respect the, the time and effort that they put, sometimes lifetime, to find the answers that now they are semi-easy for us to find in any, 
any any uh, website, etc. But everything began with Ludwig that was uh, the first one that suggested that lymph was formed by plasma that was filtrated through the capillary walls. And uh, Heidenhain, another uh, German uh, physiologist, he published the, uh, the theory of the secretion of lymphatic fluid through lymphagogues. There are substances that stimulate the production of the lymphatics. So there were two different theories, the secretion and the filtration. But it wasn't until uh, 1893 with Ernest Henry Starling that was working in Heidenheim uh, laboratory in Germany, did an experiment in which he injected peptones into the uh, uh, circulation, into intramuscular, and then recovered those peptones not only, not only in the bloodstream, but also in the lymphatic stream. So that brought him to think that there was some sort of filtration absorption mechanism within the tissues that was uh, taking place in order to move these substances. And in 1896, he uh, presented his work and it uh, was the, the first time that the uh, equilibrium between absorption and, and filtration was explained and that revolutionized the understanding of fluids, fluids in, in 1896. But of course, it was incomplete but nobody uh, proposed this because we were lacking of technology to explain this. And for more than 100 years, when I went to medical school, that's the Starling principle that I was taught. You know, the equilibrium between the arterial side, the venous side, the pressures, oncotic and hydrostatic pressures. So this is the original paper of uh, Starling when he presented this. And his experiments were, the way he, he, he started this, uh, thinking about absorption, he isolated the the, the hind leg of a dog and with a continuous perfusion of blood. And in the first uh, dog, he injected uh, sodium chloride and this was absorbed from the muscle into the bloodstream, diluting the, mo the, the blood, uh, decreasing the hematocrit account, etc. count. And this was what uh, prompted to uh, understand and propose the filtration of uh, fluids from the muscle to the bloodstream. But when he injected serum, the absorption was minimum or not. And that obviously explained, uh, or not explained, that gave more um, basis for his uh, theory of equilibrium according to the pressures, uh, the oncotic pressure, the hydrostatic pressure that protein and plasma give into the into the fluids. So with all that being said, then the Starling hypothesis was created and is basically the equilibrium. And some of these animations are going to be basic, but I understand also that med students might be watching, maybe uh, uh, college students that want to go into med school. So bear with me. So the, the, the equilibrium is between the filtration from the inside of the vessel to the extravascular space that uh, is going to be uh, regulated by the oncotic pressure of the outside of the blood vessel and the hydro hydrostatic pressure inside versus the absorption, the absorption of the fluid in the venous side with the same uh, forces but inverted inside the oncotic pressure is the one that is going to bring them in and from the interstitium the hydrostatic pressure is the one that is going to push it back in there. One of the uh, uh, researchers in Italy, Luciani, he flat out in 1911, he said that Starling's uh, conclusions were uh, so mechanical, so simple. And he wasn't far from the truth, but again, he couldn't prove it neither. Uh, it wasn't until 1927 that Landis in, in uh, the United States, when being a med student, actually devised a way to uh, uh, explain and give some backup to Starling's, uh, Starling's theory, uh, uh, principle, I'm sorry, the, 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 the Starling principle of the fluid equilibrium. He measured the hydrostatic pressure and filtration in the frog mesentery, uh, who was able to measure the pressure of the fluid and also how much was filtrated uh, in base of the red cells. He marked the red cells. So he developed a, 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 a he plot the, the amounts of filtration and absorption, and 
uh, found that at the, or he theorized that when there was not filtration or absorption, what no movement of fluid, that should be the point of equilibrium. Therefore, that pressure should be the pressure of the oncotic, oncotic uh, pressure inside the blood vessels that let the uh, uh, keep the fluid from from filtration. So he assigned that pressure to be 24, 25 uh, centimeters of of water, and also further uh, as a byproduct of this this uh, uh, experiments, he found out that when the tissues were injured, the curve was uh, skewed to the left, and therefore the filtration occurred to less pressure. That's why when there is trauma, injury, burns, the tissues swell more uh, and faster is because the pressure moves to, to the left. So having these numbers that he, uh, he found, he was able to measure the capillary pressure in human fingernail folds at heart level, and these are the numbers he found. Uh, again, remember the mean arterial uh, capillary oncotic pressure was just um, deducted from that plot the, uh, that I showed you earlier about filtration and, and absorption, and he put it at 24 millimeters of mercury. And, and the mean uh, arterial capillary pressure that he found in the arterial, in, in the arterial side, venous side, and in the capillary side are shown on the screen. So now we have the Starling hypothesis. So Landis could give a formula to this hypothesis, could express in mathematical uh, language. And the filtration per area, JV slash A, is going to be uh, equal to the hydraulic permeabil permeability, that is the ability of the fluid through, uh, uh, to go through the, um, through the vessel wall, minus the hydrostatic pressure that, as you can see in that uh, cartoon, is more in the arterial side than in the venous side, minus the interstitial pressure that is going to try to push the fluid back into the, um, into, the ins, in, into the intracapillary space. And all that subtracted from the, uh, from the product of the, uh, intra, uh, the capillary oncotic pressure, that is the, the, the force that is going to try to keep the fluid inside the blood vessels, uh, minus the interstitial oncotic pressure. Now, once we have a mathematical formula for this, becomes a principle. The Landis equation is not the uh, Starling, Starling's hypothesis, is the Starling principle. So this was the formula that we, uh, as med students, learn, uh, and still in some places still is the one that is taught. So based on this, uh, discoveries on these experiments for many people. We didn't talk about Pappenheimer and Soto Rivera because for sake of time, this is the uh, drawing that uh, the cartoon that all of us will learn from the arterial side. The blood pressure is going to force the blood, the, uh, the filtration from the capillary. The blood pressure is the um, hydrostatic pressure. And the on oncotic pressure is going to try to keep that fluid inside the blood vessel. Because the blood pressure is higher, the net pressure pushes the fluid uh, out of the vessel. When it passes to the venous side, this is reversed. The blood pressure decreases. The osmotic pressure is the same. And then the net filtration, uh, the net pressure is negative and the filtration, uh, and the filtration stops. And the fluid is reabs reabsorbed into the uh, vein side. This explained, according to uh, uh, Starling and uh, all the subsequent researches, beautifully the equilibrium in the capillary and how this works. So in this other animation, we can see that some of the fluid will be returned by the lymphatic vessels. But minimum amount, because most of it is going to be reabsorbed in the venous side of the capillary, in the venue. And we stay there for, again, for more than 100 years. And uh, in 1951, another um, variant was added to the equation. Staberman 
uh, develop the uh, reflection coefficient. What is this? This is the original paper that he produced. And we know that some molecules are going to cross the, uh, the uh, blood vessel easily. That equals to zero. Sigma is the reflection coefficient uh, symbol. But there are other that they don't cross at all because the size don't allow that. That is one. One is total. Uh, it was, uh, number one is when the, the membrane is totally impermeable. Number zero is with permeable. But something happens with those some molecules. Some molecules can change, adapt, and then go through it. And therefore, the number can be, uh, can be different and can be adjusted. What this brought is another uh, variant to the equation. Now we need to add that sigma into the oncotic side of the, of the equation because not all the proteins are going to cross the blood vessel membrane. And that will give us more accurate information regarding pressures uh, uh, that are going to maintain inside or outside of the blood vessel. In uh, 1963, Guyton uh, was able to measure the interstitial hydrostatic and oncotic pressures. That wasn't uh, done uh, before. This was very tricky, but he was able to figure this out. And to his surprise, the numbers were way smaller than he thought. And now the numbers were completed uh, along with the ones that Landis found earlier. And Landis and uh, Pappenheimer actually calculated the values of absorption and filtration, and those are the numbers, these two uh, researchers brought us the numbers that we manage now that uh, from 7,000 liters of uh, uh, blood that yeah, crosses the capillaries in 24 hours, 20 liters are filtrated, 16 to 18 are reabsorbed, giving a net uh, uh, lymphatic production of 4 liters. So going back a little bit in history, and uh, Ernest Rosca and Max Knoll, and they developed the electron microscope in 1931. You can see there in the slide at the beginning, the numbers were uh, 10 nanometers per resolution, and then improved so much in 1944 that went to 2 nanometers per resolution. The importance of this, and why am I mentioning elect electron microscope when we're talking about the capillary, is because in 1940, uh, uh, Daniele was the first one to see this fuzzy-like endothelial layer that was named uh, glycocalyx by Loft in 1966. Um, this glycocalyx plays a huge role in fluid equilibrium, as we we're going to see in this last part of the uh, presentation. So it's a hydrogel-like hydro, uh, la layer that um, you know has a hemodynamic function that was uh, discovered in 1970 and has a lot of um, a total surface in our body. I know we are not used to metric system in the United States, but it's about 4,000 to 7,000 square meters. That equals to 0 0.98 to 1.7 acres. This is huge. The thickness depends on the vessel, and they have a negative charge that is given by the protein and have different functions. Uh, the hydrodynamic exclusion layer, uh, modulating leukocyte uh, attachment, they are uh, transducer mechanoreceptors, uh, a lot of functions, but the one we are going to concentrate here uh, today is the molecular sieve that determines the oncotic forces across the endothelium as well as the reservoir. So the structure is complex, and we are going to just go uh, in a brief uh, way through the components. We are not going to go one by one, uh, but you know, has proteoglycans that are mainly mainly the syndicants and glipicans, and I mention this because the syndicants are being used now or they are in research in, in, uh, uh, for research purposes. They are, gonna, they are measuring as a, one of the indicators of how severe the disease is in patients in ICU because the degradation of the glycocalyx, the syndicant one. So glycoproteins like selectins, integrins, and immunoglobulins, glycosamine glycans, with heparan sulfate, that, as you know, is the natural anticoagulant that we have in our uh, blood vessels, and other components, as we can see in the uh, slide. So from this simple diagram that we start, and the startling uh, hypothesis becomes this complex. 
when the uh, glycocalyx is hydrated and has uh, albumin trapped within uh, the structure, etc., it's also known as an epithelial surface layer. If you can, you can find it that way, ESL. And as you can see, it's a very complex uh, structure. This is an original uh, picture from uh, Wayne Bond, that is one of the lead researchers in glycocalyx. As you can see, all the components are very well um, uh, organized and they interact with each other in a very uh, intimate way. It's a beautiful design, uh, incredible from this view from above, uh, one of those uh, miracles that life has for us. And if I need to mention four people that have um, revolutionized the understanding of the glycocalyx and the physiological functions in fluid equilibrium are these four gentlemen. Uh, there are many, but those are, these are the leaders, Charles Michel, Roger Adamson, uh, Rodney Levick, and Sheldon Wenbaum. Uh, I didn't find a picture of Dr. Levick, so it's not, it's not being, uh, I'm not trying to be funny, it's just I didn't find a picture, so I put that generic uh, figure. Now, of all these gentlemen, Roger Adamson is the one that we are going to discuss briefly here because gave the foundation to the new revised theory. In 2004, uh, he was measuring pressures and, and concentrations, et cetera, outside and outside, inside and outside the blood vessels. And he was able to control the amount of protein inside and outside the blood vessel. And despite that the oncotic pressure was the same, there was a 70% difference of pressure in uh, intraluminal and extraluminal interstitial fluid. And that took him to go deeper into the glycocalyx, and is when the subglycocalyx space uh, was better described. And this space is, like the name says, is under the glycocalyx, almost in the uh, in the vessel wall, and this area has their own pressures, hydrostatic and oncotic pressure, that that interacts with the intravascular pressure, intraluminal pressure, and then then interacts with the interstitial pressure. So it's a uh, filter. There is no direct communication between the inside of the blood vessel and the interstitium. This is this is shocking because it changes the whole understanding of the physiological uh, uh, equilibrium in the blood vessels. And uh, this is from one of the papers that by Levick, another of those four gentlemen that are leaders in the um, glycocalyx studies, that you can see the difference, the huge difference between the classic stylic principle on the top of the uh, picture and the revised uh, in the bottom. And this also went to describe the two hemodynamic states. The steady state is when the constant capillary pressure is present and produce constant filtration throughout the capillary. There is no reabsorption in the vein side. The transient state is when we have a sudden variation in the pressure, when there is an acute bleeding, and then there is some uh, absorption in the vein, in the venous side for a short period of time. Some researchers have found up to uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes after this happens, the equilibrium reassumes and the uh, steady states reassume and filtration happens. So what happened with the initial concept that Starling had? Well, was he wrong? No. He was, the theory was incomplete because by him having an isolated leg of a dog and having the perfusion somehow rudimentary, but uh, you know, the time was done, he kept this in a, a, a transient state. Therefore, was absorption in the venous side. So he never got the chance to get into the steady state and disprove this, uh, uh, his con the concept that he tried to promote. So the, the, the Starling principle is not wrong, it's not just incomplete, but now with this new information we can uh, correct some of these concepts that we have managed throughout, the, throughout the, uh, all these years. And once again, we need to correct the equation, then doesn't need to be the interstitial, 
uh, is the soft glycocalyx pressure, uh, hydrostatic pressure, and the oncotic pressure. And that will give us a better value of the fluid exchange. So some concepts that now make sense, as you can see there, uh, I'm just going to mention one of them, you know, the, uh, in, in, in the last one, in septic and non-septic patients, the fluid resuscitation with albumin improves cardiac output, but no pulmonary edema. No, because the equilibrium no is with the outside. Uh, the number two, you know, mentioned that you can give albumin, the way some people uh, we used to do, give albumin and then Lasix, the Lasix sandwich to remove fluid from the lungs, and it never worked. Why? Because the only thing was happening is the, the glycocalyx was being dehydrated. So that, it, that uh, cartoon that we have at the beginning now is different after the revised Starling principle by, uh, led by Adamson and uh, those four researchers that I mentioned earlier. And this is the important thing. Most of the interstitial water or fluid is returned through the lymphatic circulation. There is no absorption in the vein site. So suddenly the lymphatics, those puny vessels that nobody wanted really to mess with them, become significantly important in the equilibrium and the physiology of uh, fluids. So this is just a brief, brief um, uh, review of why I think this new trend of bringing the veins and the lymphatics together uh, has exploded all over the world because the lymphatics play a huge role uh, as we saw here and they cannot be ignored or put aside anymore. They need to be integrated into the circulation. Uh, anyway, this is the end of the presentation. Um, I want to apologize for some of the tongue twisters. I'm not used to uh, do live TV. This is the first one, and I'm all excited. Uh, but uh, as a second part, uh, we are going to bring uh, Dr. Joseph Noem. is one of our partners. He's a vascular surgeon here in Houston. He is in Clear Lake, uh, uh, in the Methodist Hospital in Clear Lake. And he has vast experience in vein disease. He has published articles. Uh, Joe, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Hello, how are you? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just That's fine, sir. Good to be here. How is Clear Lake? Is it raining a lot? Well, we we're past the rain. We had a few rainy days, but now, now we're all okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys are doing okay. So, Joe, uh, I know you've been interested in veins and lymphatics and... Uh, what tell us, uh, you know, what the, uh, some concepts that you manage so well between uh, uh, the venal lymphatic uh, pathology, pathophysiology, and the relation between the two of them? What is your experience in that? What have you uh, encountered in that relation? So, yeah, so th thanks for the question. When I think about venous disease, I always think about venous disease as being sort of arising from three distinct components. One of them is the increased hydrostatic pressure. That, that can lead to uh, venous distension and valve dysfunction and so forth. And then we know that the increase in hydrostatic pressure that can occur in the venous system can potentially overwhelm slightly the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system has about a one to four millimeter mercury pressure where they can accommodate that sort of uh, uh, increased uh, 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 transudation or the increased amount of fluid that occurs within the lymphatics. Beyond that, the lymphatics get overwhelmed and they and the stroke volume within the lymphatics does not keep up with it. Oh. I think it froze. Um, I can't believe I want to say this. The worst in the venous okay. disease, the worst thing, the edema, but the edema is not necessarily due to the veins Joe, but Joe, the overwhelming lymphatic. Joe, I'm sorry, you, 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 we lost you for a few seconds. Can you repeat this, the last part, uh, please, when you were saying about the, uh, the, the pressures that the lymphatics are managing and then the volume increases, etc. Yeah, so the, the lymphatics can tolerate about a one to four millimeter of mercury uh, pressure within the, their transmural uh, pressure. So if the transmural pressure increases over four millimeters or so, then the lymphatics can overwhelm and their stroke volume, they will not be able to push that excess lymphatic fluid up. And that leads to worsening edema. So that's one of the correlations between venous disease and lymphatic disease as they come together and present with symptoms. Number two is sort of that biochemical or hormonal changes that occur within the vessel wall. 
And we know that there's a lot of inflammatory markers within lymphedema and a lot of inflammatory markers that also lead to varicose veins. And varicose veins are associated with increased inflammation, superoxides, and so forth. And treating those elements have been shown to help with swelling edema. Uh, unfortunately, here in the U.S., for our listeners abroad, they will be more familiar with solodexide and calcium dubicillate. Correct. These are two compounds that will help uh, decrease inflammation, uh, increase venous tone, and also Im improve lymphatic flow. So by addressing those elements, we can address the chemical component. And lastly, the way I think about venous disease and how it correlates with lymphatic disease is genetics. There's, for example, the FOXC2 gene variant. So the FOXC2 gene has been associated to, uh, or sort of it appears to be overexpressed in patients with uh, varicose veins and lymphedema. And we know that the FOX2 gene, one of its variants may be associated with the formation of venous valves and lymphatic valves. So by putting these three together, we can kind of tap on the sort of the association between varicose veins and lymphedema and vice versa. Great. Yes. So, you know, you touch a point there that I think is very interesting uh, for us, you know, surgeons that is a trend that is going all over the world and frankly has helped explain some of these issues in many diseases, but I don't see why in venal lymphatic disease it would not. It's about inflammation. The inflammatory, right. uh, the general inflammation that we are, uh, uh, seems like a part every day in everything we do, everything we eat, etc. So um, do you have any experience with, uh, um, you know, antioxidants in this kind of disease, or what? What uh, alternative medication have you uh, have you used, or you have any experience uh, in your so, patients for vein disease or lymphatic disease that might ameliorate the inflammatory response? So exactly. So if I find a patient that I'm suspicious that there may be more of a lymphatic component to their to their symptoms, you know, patients who have a few spider veins, varicose veins, not a lot of reflux. Or, or venous pathology, and I'm more suspicious that the, the swelling of the inflammation may be more related to the lymphatic, uh, you know, I think calcium dubicillate will work very well. Unfortunately, we don't have that available here. That's available abroad, and I used that a lot when I was abroad. Sulodexide is also available abroad, not here. Abroad, we ha also have other medications such as uh, just plain old diosmin or the daflone, which is the, the sort of uh, brand name for the medication. Sure. Uh, and then in Italy, you will find... Um, uh, Cyclo 3 4 I believe it's probably, I think it's an Italian uh, brand, and they have uh, um, other, other medications. Here in the U.S., unfortunately, we don't have these medicines as, as sort of a pharmaceutical grade, but we do have options. Uh, if we're going to be a purist, we, have, we can purchase a plain old diosmin. You can go on Amazon or any other uh, site, and you can order pure diosmin. And they also have other medications that are a combination where they have hesperidin, horse, horse chestnut, grapeseed extract, uh, diosmin extract um, available in combination. The way I look at it is if somebody has purely a venous component uh, or significant varicose veins, I tend to lean towards using uh, diosmin. Once or twice a day, 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams will work. If I find that somebody has a sort of a, a mixed inflammatory kind of thing, uh, and I'm suspicious there might be some component of lymphedema, I may be more inclined to use a combination uh, group of herbs, something that may contain uh, grapeseed extract, hesperidine, diosmin, and so forth, because I think just kind of having a, a, a multi-prong uh, approach to their problem may help. Um, I've looked a lot to see if I can find uh, uh, calcium dubicillate here in the U.S., but we don't, we don't have that here, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, so those are the alternatives that we have. Um, have, have, you, have you, I'm, I'm sorry, therapy. I'm sorry, Joe. When when you were abroad, because you know, uh, not many people know this, but Dr. Naum uh, uh, practiced in, in in Lebanon for a few years. And when you were abroad, and you have access to those um, those components, did you have good results? Did you use them? Uh, and you, what was your experience with them if you use them? So uh, my, the, the experience was actually great. Symptom relief was fantastic. Many patients who experienced heaviness, tiredness of the legs, itching at the site yeah, of the veins yeah. and so forth, 
they did ha have some relief. Some patients responded better to a medication versus others. So if one didn't work, you can switch it because each medicine has a different combination or a different weight on what, they're, what uh, compounds they're using. Uh, patients with venous ulcers tend to do much better. Their healing improves. And that's part also one of the guidelines where, you know, diosmin is recommended as part of the guidelines for patients with CAP6 uh, 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 disease, right? So, so uh, I find that that helps, helps with some of the swelling, but the swelling alone will improve 5, 8, 12, 15%, but it will improve significantly more with compression. And, and for those patients who have sort of, uh, you know, class one lymphedema or, or sort of CAP3 uh, venous disease, the combination of compression and uh, the medication will, will help them regress at least one level, you know, get rid of the edema and get them back to the CAP2. Compression alone works, but I think the combination of the two medications will help improve symptom relief. And there's some data suggesting that almost 60% of the patients after about two to three weeks may, may find that most of her, their symptoms improve with the combination therapy. Correct. You, you touch about another, another important topic in uh, the venal lymphatic arena that is compression. You know, and uh, here in Houston, you know, I mean, it's hot, it's humid, um, and it's difficult for patients to uh, wear the compression garments, you know, throughout the year the way it's supposed to be. So, you know, any, any, what is your experience regarding the pressures that we use, uh, that you use for venal lymphatic disease combined? You know, what is the gradient that you prefer using, or when they have uh, ulceration involved. Any any advice uh, regarding the pressure management? So uh, again, the, the recommendations are, for, especially for lymphatic disease, the higher the pressure, the better, of course. The problem is it's so hard to wear something that's very tight for a long period of time, especially if it's hot, because then you itch, you start where you want to scratch, and then you break down the skin and so forth. So my approach with patients is wear, start with low pressure, and go up with the pressure as much as you can tolerate wearing the compression garment all day. So if you cannot get to the, to the 30 to 40, it's okay. Stay 20 to 30, but wear it all day because that's better than wearing the 30 to 40 or the 40 to 50 only a couple hours a day and, and then removing it <clears throat> and not wearing it for the rest of the day. Because Correct. the moment you remove the garment, that's it. You return back to almost baseline. So I find that that's important. Patients who have ulcers, I like to use sort of the compression wraps, not necessarily the una boots and stuff, but there are these compression garments that are kind of come with Velcro. So the garment comes together and you tighten the Velcro and then you can gradually figure out where the compression is. So my rule there is if you have an ulcer, you start with a, you know, wound care daily, because I think cleaning the wound every day is very important. This thing about, you know, wrapping a boot and keeping it there for a few days and letting all the fibrinous stuff remain in place, I don't think it's conducive to healing. We know that fibrinous exudate kind of decreases wound healing and so forth. So we clean it every day, we put the compression garments, and then they're easier for the patient to wear because it's just a Velcro. Sometimes they need a second hand to help them adjust the Velcro. Yeah. But I find it that in general, with good compression, within six to eight weeks, most wounds will heal to the point that now you can actually get a good ultrasound to look at the perforators and see what's there and to go for the next day. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. You know, I, I've been a, in, an advocate, and, and you know this openly, that you, when we prescribe compression stockings for patients with venal, venal lymphatic disease and ulcerations, you know, the textbook has a specific numbers that we need to recommend because the pressure is the one that is going to help relieve the, uh, mechanically the, 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 the fluid from the, from the affected area. But it's true also that the patients are not able to put them on. You know, if you have a patient that, you know, is, uh, you know, 70, 80 years old with arthritis, there is no way they are going to put a 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury compression successfully. No way, right? So I, I'm, I'm with you. I agree completely. In the patients that are just starting with, um, with this uh, therapy, I like to start low and then slowly going up 
to get some benefit out of that compression. I normally start with 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury, and I've been criticized about that, but it's more likely that the patient is gonna wear it. Doesn't help writing a prescription for, you know, 30 to 40 or 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury if the compression is gonna stay in the jaw. What good is that gonna do? So I completely understand and agree with you. In some patients, even in some patients, I go to the point to recommend wearing leggings. You know, they are not even graded, but it's some pressure versus nothing and get some benefit out of it. Especially patients that are overweight, that is gonna be expensive to get the garment um, because they are expensive when they are custom made, then you start having uh, problems in regards of uh, cost and, 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 and time. So I'd rather them buy in a pair of leggings out of, uh, made of Spanx or Lycra that are gonna deliver some pressure. So I'm just echoing your comment because it doesn't help anybody write the correct prescription for those compressions if the patient is unable to put them on or take them off. No, I agree with you. One of the biggest complaints of patients is for not wearing the compression stockings that they hurt and they're too tight. So the goal is to kind of ease them into wearing something light, letting them get used to the tightness and moving on. But you bring one good point about patients who are overweight. Um, you know, the problem with overweight patients is that the problem is they're overweight is, uh, and that increases hydrostatic pressure and so forth. So, you know, wearing compression stockings is almost like trying to dry up the floor because the faucet is leaking. We got to stop the leakage. Correct. So I've been in the past few years, more aggressive in having the patient understand their problem and recommending bariatric surgery because many patients know they have to lose weight. They've tried to lose weight and they're not losing weight and their weight is actually going up since they first start having the symptoms. And uh, so I, I've been sort of more, uh, uh, sort of more of a proponent of bariatric surgery. Get them to lose weight because it's been proven that once they lose the weight, you know, a lot of the changes of venous insufficiency tend to regress, uh, except for the pigmentation and so forth. But most of the stuff regresses, inflammation goes down, the swelling goes down, everything gets so much better. And uh, so that, that's, that's something I've, I've kind of changed a lot in my practice. Yeah, you know, I, I personally, when I discuss the weight uh, with my patients, um, you know, I, I try to encourage them to lose the weight healthy in a healthy way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I personally, personally think that those diets that make you lose 10 pounds in one week or something crazy, they, they are just starving your, uh, your body and you are going to rebound with more, most likely. Um, there are some papers out there that recommend losing weight about a pound a, a week until you lose about 10% of your weight and then you decrease to half a pound until you reach the weight you want to you wanna achieve. That is more physiological, uh, physiological in order to, to, to lose weight. But it is important. And another thing that I explain to them is, uh, and I think I discussed this with you before, is I tell them, you know, the, the, the fat that is in your, in your body is not just sitting there doing nothing. That tissue is actively producing inflammatory substances that are slowly Correct. killing you 24-7. They are attacking your heart, your brain, your kidneys. So it is very important to, to understand that it's not just there and I'm going to start losing the weight tomorrow or the next week. No, it's something that is actively killing you right now. And when they perceive that different, uh, that different angle, it seems like they can commit better to do something about that silent killer that is in their bodies, you know. But it, it, weight is a tremendous problem in being a lymphatic disease. And, and we are fighting against uh, all the, you know, all the system, all the food products and all the advertising and everything. And, and, and you know, I'm guilty of that. I'm not saying, you know, all of us. And, and then events that happen, like this pandem pandemic that we are going through, many people without even noticing have increased their weight because their life changes. Their life changes yeah. and, 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 and it's difficult. So, um, Joe, we are uh, almost out of time. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Anything else you can add about being a lymphatic disease? I, I really think patients need to be approached with a sort of a multi-modality kind of uh, mindset where it's not just, you know, 
patient comes in with varicose veins, we're going to see if there's reflux and treat the reflux, and that, that's the end of the story. That's like the last part, because even if you treat reflux, we know that recurrence is usually occurs after five years and, and so on. So we need to really have the patient understand the problem. We, got, we have to treat the, all the causes. Increased hydrostatic pressure. Well, is it a valvular problem? Is it the, the, the increased weight? Is there uh, something going on? Is, uh, you know, then we have to treat these sort of inflammatory markers. And I like to use the, these venotonic medications. For the generic part, we, genetic part, we can't do anything, but at least we can treat two out of the three major causes. And then, then I, the most important element now for treatment is compression stocking. We're fortunate here in the U.S. that almost every place we go to has an air condition. So it's air conditioned. So wearing the saw, the compression is not as difficult indoors. Outdoors is a different story here in Houston. But in the wintertime, I think most people, if not everybody, should have compression stockings at home because my daily st socks are compression stockings because we're standing. What we see is as we get older, 70% of the 75-year-olds will have varicose veins or some form of veins. So we're, so this way, by, by changing our lifestyle, wearing compression garments, you know, taking uh, um, uh, these anti-inflammatory medications, for those who have varicose veins, for those who don't have varicose veins, avoid inflammation. So avoid these canned foods, avoiding, uh, um, uh, you know, being overweight and so forth. Exercising is good. Uh, all those things are important. So we really need to see a patient and start at attacking, you know, the chemical changes that happen in varicose veins, the, the, the actual changes of the veins, and then looking at the patient and realizing, is there a lymphatic component? Because not all varicose veins just cause a lot of leg swelling. A lot of the swelling occurs with the big varicose veins. But those patients who have just these little spinal reticulum veins without massive reflux, that's probably more lymphatic related. And it's a matter of kind of changing that. And the last thing I want to make sure people understand is swelling in the face of varicose veins is not necessarily varicose vein related. You have to look for other causes. Are they hyperthyroid, right? Is there right-sided heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, especially in the elderly? You know, are they fluid overloaded from just congestive heart failure and they're not taking enough diuretics? Or are they eating, you know, a lot of salt in their diet, a lot of soy sauce, or they're taking a lot of ramen noodles, which has a significant amount of, uh, of uh, salt in it. So probing into the patient's diet is also important because, again, varicose veins alone don't necessarily cause swelling in the leg. There's a multimodality uh, for that. Yeah, I, and I agree. You touch another good point. Every, I think everybody in uh, needs to have some sort of compression garments because another thing that I that I have discussed with my patients is, uh, you know, people that have normal uh, venous system that is competent in the lower extremities, but they work as tellers, teachers, nurses. They swell. Yeah. And they panic. Why am I swelling? My veins are fine. Well, because we are not designed to be standing with no movement, just steady. We are not, the body is not designed for that. So even normal, competent, functioning uh, veins in the lower extremities, when you stress them by no moving, by not contracting the calves, they will swell to some degree. So obviously it's recommended to wear compression stockings. I completely agree with you. Well, uh, Joe, I, I want to thank you for joining us today in our, in our first show. You are, uh, uh, you know, a special guest today. You help us uh, uh, kick this, uh, uh, this up and start, start the, the Vino Lymphatic Forum. I appreciate it. Of course, we are going to be working together in the future and uh, with more shows. And, um, and, and I'm excited about this, Joe. But thank you for coming uh, to our show and, uh, and share your knowledge. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Anytime, All my best. friend. Bye. Take care.